Good morning and welcome to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My name is Bill Benson. I am the host of the museum's public program, First Person. We are in our 17th year of the First Person program. Thanks for joining us today. Our first person today is Mr. Jacques Fine, whom we shall meet shortly. This 2016 season of First Person is made possible by the generosity of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation. We are grateful for their sponsorship. First Person is a series of conversations with survivors of the Holocaust who share with us their firsthand accounts of their experience during the Holocaust. Each of our First Person guests serves as volunteers here at this museum. Our 2016 First Person program closes with today's program. The museum's website, listed on the back of your program, will provide information about our 2017 First Person program. The website is www.ushmm.org. Anyone interested in keeping in touch with the museum and its programs can complete the Stay Connected card that you'll find in your program or speak with a museum representative at the back of the theater when we close today's program. In doing so, you will receive an electronic copy of Jacques Fine's biography so that you can remember and share his testimony after you leave here today. Jacques will share with us his first person account of his experience during the Holocaust and as a survivor for about 45 minutes. Uh, if we have time at the end of our program, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask Jacques some questions. The life stories of Holocaust survivors transcend the decades. What you are about to hear from Jacques is one individual's account of the Holocaust. And we begin with this photograph taken in late 1941 of Jacques with his mother, Roja, and his younger sister, Annette. Jacques was born Jacques Carpic in Paris, France on October 10, 1938. His parents, Schmuel and Roja, were born in Poland in the 1910s but relocated to France. The arrow on this map of France points to Paris. Germany invaded France in May 1940. The next month in June, France signed an armistice with Germany. Under the terms of the armistice, northern France, including Paris, came under German rule, and southern France remained unoccupied. Here we have a group portrait of the Karpik family with an aunt, uncle, and cousins taken shortly after the German invasion of France. Jacques' parents are on the left, and he is seated at the bottom. After Germany invaded France, Jacques and his sister were hidden with the Bocahouts, a Catholic family just outside of Paris. Here we see a portrait of the Bocahout family at a wedding. Jacques and his sister, who were in hiding with the family at that time, are circled. Jacques is in front of Suzanne Bocahout, and Annette is in front of Marcel Bocahout. While Jacques and Annette were in hiding, their parents were deported to transit camps and then to Auschwitz. Pictured here are prisoners in the Pithy VA transit camp. Jacques, Jacques' father, Schmuel, is the man smoking the cigarette on your right. After the war, Jacques and Annette were placed in orphanages, then later adopted by an American couple, Harry and Rose Fine. We close with Jacques' passport photo taken in 1948. After their adoption by the Fines in 1948, Jacques and Annette began their new life in the United States, growing up in New Jersey. Jacques attended Clark University in Massachusetts, majoring in math. After attending graduate school at NYU, he began his career as a computer scientist in the aerospace industry, starting with Martin Marietta in Baltimore. He retired in the same field after 38 years with Computer Sciences Corporation, or CSC. Jacques has a daughter, Rachel, and a son, Matthew, from his first marriage. In 1986, he married his second wife, Judy Illiff, whose daughter, Laura, and her husband, David, have opened a very successful ice cream parlor in Baltimore, the Charmery. Jacques and Judy have four grandchildren, Sam, Zachary, Adrian, and Marguerite, or Maggie, who celebrated her second birthday in June. Judy and Jacques live in Elk Ridge, Maryland, about midway between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Judy is here today with Jacques, as is his daughter, Rachel, and her friend, Melissa Madison, and we have them all right here in the front row. Um, in 1983, Jacques attended the American Gathering of Jewish Survivors of the Holocaust, where he found other survivors who were children during the war. After that, he and others formed the organization, Washington Baltimore Survivors of the Holocaust, Last Generation. Jacques is a former president of the Jewish Federation of Howard County, Maryland, and is very active as a volunteer in his community. 
In 2011, Jacques was recognized as the Howard County Volunteer of the Year. The Howard County Volunteer of the Year coordinator said about Jacques, quote, he was affected at such a young age, he took a terrible thing and has done greatness with it, end quote. Jacques became co-president of OSE USA in 2014, an organization we will learn more about later. On June 6, 2014, Jacques and Judy attended the 70th anniversary of D-Day commemoration at the World War II Memorial here in Washington, D.C., where he was able, as Jacques said, to thank a few Normandy veterans for saving not only my life, but the lives of all the world. Jacques volunteers here at this museum, where you will find him at the donor's desks on Thursdays. Jacques volunteers because, as he says, years ago he was saved by strangers and with the help of the Jewish community. Now he says it's payback time. And with that, I'd like uh, to ask you to join me in welcoming our first person, Mr. Jacques Fine. Jacques, thank you so much for joining us today and your thank willingness you. to, to be our first person. You have a, a great deal to share with us, so we'll, we'll get started right away. And we have a, for our last program of the year, we have a large and great audience, so here we go. Jacques, World War II, of course, began in September 1939 with Germany's invasion of Poland. The following May, Germany invaded France. You were just a year and a half old at that time. Before we turn to the war years and the Holocaust, tell us what you can about your parents and what their life may have been like in pre-war Paris, knowing that you were far too young to have your own memories. You've had to piece things together and learn what you can over okay. time. So when the war started, I was only 11 months old. So as far as my memories of my parents, I have virtually nothing. And I don't even remember what they looked like until many years later when I received those pictures. Mm -hmm. And what I understand from my cousin, when they emigrated to, uh, to Paris, uh, my father was a tailor, my mother was a housekeeper wife, mm -hmm. and that's how they made their living. With many other Jewish immigrants from uh, Eastern Poland. And that was basically their life. Uh, I got this information also from my cousin who survived the war. She's five years older than I am. And she did write me a letter in 1984 talking about my parents, and that's what she told me. Mm -hmm. So I have to believe her. And, mm -hmm. I, I still, and I do believe that also because from reading the history of the Jew, you know, foreign Jews that came to Paris, that was basically their life. Knitters, tailors housekeepers trying to make a living. Do you, have you learned what life may have been like in general for, for uh, Jews who had immigrated from Poland in Paris at that time? Well, probably they had to, they had to uh, assimilate, mm -hmm. which was not very easy because uh, it was the mid-30s and already things were happening in, uh, well, they came from anti-Semitic uh, Poland mm -hmm. and things were happening in Germany in the 1930s, so people knew what, what, what you know, they had a sense of what was going to happen. Right. Hitler's coming to power. And they were they poor also, so, you and know, if okay. you need, in the world, sometimes you need money to, to get out. Mm -hmm. And you've never been able to learn why they went to Paris? Uh, or... uh, sort of. Mm -hmm. Again, this is secondhand from my cousin, but A, to escape anti-Semitism. And again, that's pretty common from, uh, you know, from history, right. from reading books and for better economic conditions. And I believe also there were other family, family members who emigrated mm -hmm. to Paris, like my cousin and, uh, and her family. Have you been able to learn how large your extended family may have been? Um, have you that's a very good question. The answer is I have no idea. No idea. Okay. So that's one of the issues of our lives, that we don't know who, who the family was and how many we had. And I also know that most of the details about your parents being rounded up, sent to camps, and then later departed, deported to Auschwitz are unknown to you. you. You believe your father was taken in 1941, possibly in May, and your mother in July of 1942. Have you been able to learn anything about the circumstances concerning your father's uh, father being taken okay. by the Germans so and about where he was sent? That's a good question. So how do I know they were taken right. in those, on those dates? There's a famous hunter of uh, 
uh, Nazis in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, Serge, Serge Klausfeld, who documented all the Jews who left, uh, in this case, who were deported from Paris, France. Mm -hmm. from, oh, sorry, from France. From France. And I was able to get that book, and I knew my last name. And with the help of some other people, my father was taken on Convoy 3 in, uh, in July uh, 1941. And my mother was in Convoy 51 in uh, July, 19, sometimes in 1943. So, uh, so at it's least documented. A year, two plus, years later. Yeah, yeah. plus all, I also have in here, which is not shown, documents from the uh, French police that was mm -hmm. done in the 1940s, late 40s, mm -hmm. showing the dates where my father was born when he was taken. The same thing with my mother. Mm -hmm. So it's been documented. But again, I do not know anything of what happened. Right, right. What do you What do you know about Pithy VA, the camp that your father was sent to? What have you learned about that place? It was basically a transit camp, and people thought it was a place. For, you know, some of the Jews thought this was a place of where they would they had to be sent. They, they were a temporary place, but then eventually they learned the situation that they were sent by train to Paris and then to uh, by train to uh, Auschwitz. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the word got around. Was it close to Paris, Pithy no, VA? Uh, it was uh, uh, this south of Paris, somewhere south, south of Paris. Of Paris. Mm -hmm. and, and they went, uh, and my mother, my father was in Pithy VA, and my mother was eventually sent to Drancy, Sea, which was north of Paris. I mean, that was, it were, that was a really the terrible transit camp where. Drancy was? Yeah. Okay. And, and by transit camp, meaning, meaning literally a holding, a hold, a right. holding place, okay. It, it wasn't a concentration camp per se, but it was not a place that you would want to live. Right, right. How were you able to get the photograph of your father at Pithy VA? Okay, I, in 1984, I found out, uh, actually 1983, I found out that I did have cousins alive. So from 1948 to 45 years later, I found out. Uh, that was the first you learned about 35 it. 35 years later, I found out that wow. I have some cousins living. I found that from my sister, who's two years younger, but has been living in Israel since 1962. And, and after that convention in 1983, mm -hmm. I wrote to my sister to see if she knows anything. And then she told me. And then I eventually wrote to my cousins. And when I visited them, I believe I got that picture from them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was quite amazing. It, it is amazing that you have that right. photograph, right. really amazing. So those photographs that you saw here, mm -hmm. I did not get those till 1984 or so. So that's from, that, from 1948 to 36 years later, I find out that these were my, my family. So the very first photographs of your parents were then in 1983. That I saw, correct. Wow. Let, let that yeah. sink in. Now, the other thing I don't yeah. know is how, you know, where, where it was taken, what conditions. Right. right. None of that. Jacques, from, from what you know, um, sometime after your father was taken and before your mother was also caught in a German roundup, your mother arranged for you and your sister to be hidden with a French Catholic family. Mm -hmm. What have you been able to learn, if anything, about the roundup that took your mother and, and about okay. going to Drancy? So in uh, July 16th, I think, 1942, there was a major roundup of Jews in Paris. So at first, the foreign, you know, the, initial, uh, uh, the initial effort was to take foreign Jews, foreign male Jews. So your, your, your family. So that was Polish. my father, yep. 1941, and my uncle. But then things got tighter and stricter, and people and the people were following orders. They had to uh, they had to sign up with the police. They had to show identification. They had to follow. The, you know, people were following the, the law. They were foreigners in a you know in a strange land, but and they were they knew they were in danger. So um, and then the French police, the French government, and the German government tightened the noose on the Jews. And they had a major roundup in June, July of 1942. Now, there were other roundups before that and that time, but that was a major one. And my mother got somewhat caught in that process. Mm -hmm. I understand that she didn't wear um, 
when Judy and I visited that family many years ago, in 1986, I think, um, she didn't wear her yellow star, and she got, you know, she got frazzled, and somehow she got caught. And after that, she was sent to Drancy, and then eventually to uh, Auschwitz. I, I think you have reason, to, you've had reason to believe she may have been grabbed on the Paris subway system. That's, what, that's what I was told. That's what you were again, told. When I visited the family that hid me, I saw, in 1986, but again, I was uh, f you know, a good 40 years after the war ended, right, right. and they were teenagers at that time. And yeah. so, as you mentioned, there were there were many roundups, but that one most that was a big one, infamous, right? the yeah. Velodrome Inf Vere. Yeah, not only that, it, it, one of the reasons it was infamous, it before you know the men had been taken, and it took women and children, mm -hmm. so they were taken and living in horrible, horrible conditions. Mm -hmm and then sent to uh, convoys and to, by train. Over those two days, I believe, what, something like 13,000 Jews were taken? Uh, I'm not quite sure of the number, but. A huge yeah. number, and, right. and all, uh, weren't they kept in uh, the velodrome, which yeah. was a bicycle right. mm -hmm. racing stadium, a small right. one? And what yeah. happened also, you know, although the Germans were involved, were the uh, key instigators of World War II and the anti-Semitism, the French, the French police were uh, more than willing to uh, get as many Jewish people as possible. They, they did most of the rounding yeah. up at mm -hmm. that point. In fact, that particular roundup, I think, has been this, it's been the subject of yeah. books and movies. There's uh, one movie, what, Sarah's Key, I Sarah's think, Key, which, right. is, which is about that roundup. But let me tell you one, one more thing I just remembered about uh, the police. Judy and I visited the uh, museum in uh, Paris, France, the Museum de la Shoah, and uh, they have, un it's unbelievable how many records they have. And one of them we found in one of the records, the, the French police wrote, uh, Cherchez les, les enfants, or at the street where I was living. And that meant in English, you know, look for the children or get the children. Get the children. So that was my sister and I, obviously. So. As you were telling us, your mother went to Drancy, which mm -hmm. was a particularly horrible transit camp. Um, have you visited that? Have you visited Drancy? I did, but it was very, very quick. Yeah. We didn't have. Uh, we went many years ago, and then we went last year, but we couldn't. We didn't have the time to revisit it. But it was completely different. They have a museum and all that, but I have enough different information that right, right, no need to do that. That we got a sense of what. And as, as you've told us, you, you, you learned the convoys that took your mom right. and your father to Auschwitz. Do you, were you able to learn um, how long they were at Auschwitz, whether they were killed okay. immediately or not? Uh, well, each convoy roughly took about 1,000 Jews okay. and maybe others. And uh, since I'm pretty sure they were killed pretty much immediately. Because yet, in order to survive, you had to be strong enough to work and help out and help, well, not help, but be forced to work be slave for labor, the uh, yeah. slave labor for, with the Ger for the German war machine. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure they were pretty quick. So Jacques, of course, uh, your mother was able to, to put you into hiding. You were hidden with a French family, mm -hmm. the Boca Hoots, with whom you would remain until the end, in, end of the war in, in France. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you can about the Boca Hoots okay. and what your life was like with them, again, okay. knowing that you've okay. learned a lot later in life. Okay, again, I'm going to emphasize one, wor one word. I was very young. Right. So I was, you know, how, how much do you remember when you're two, three, four, five years right. old? Plus, I was with strangers, so not with family, and we had to be very quiet. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the process of being hidden, there was, as you, we mentioned, a French organization called Ose. Oeuvre au secours des enfants, which means the organization to save children. Let me get a drink. Mm -hmm. and, and that organization, OSE, was created specifically for that purpose? Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> During the war, yes, but that organization was initially founded in Russia in the 1920s, mm. and that was to help Jewish poor Jewish people in that time, and they, they moved out to Berlin, actually, for, and then eventually to France, but the mission during the war was to s save as many kids as possible. Okay. So, um, so we believe that the OSA, with the help of my mother, put us in hiding. And also one of the process of you know, 
finding kids and telling families you're in danger, the OZEP uh, uh, social workers would go out with leaflets and knock on doors and tell you know tell people what's happening. That if you want to be, if you want to try to save your kids, let us take them. Exactly. So I was put in a uh, safe place, mm -hmm. hidden uh, outside of Paris, where Charles de Gaulle Airport is right now. Mm. So that's how much I know. And uh, again, I was put in high roughly in 1941. I was three years old or so, and my sister was uh, one. So. What, what do you know, particularly knowing that you've met some of the Bokuhut families and have visited with them? Tell us about the Bokuhuts. What kind of family well, were they? I tell you what, I don't remember being scared per se, mm -hmm. or being uh, hungry, or being that uh, hurt. And I just I remember living with them, but I don't remember my day-to-day -day life. Of course not. It was on a farm, it was with other kids. So, so you were in a farm, you were outside of Paris? Outside the farm, right. Okay. So, um, you know, we didn't see much of war, any of war, except um, twice, uh, maybe three times. One time, um, they had to be very careful, you know, like Anne Frank was hidden in an apartment building in uh, Amsterdam, and then her neighbors, the neighbors betrayed her. So one day, the parents of the family put my sister and I in a ditch with a blanket over us. And I, to this day, I still can't remember, see, you know, maybe, I don't know, 150 yards away, uh, soldiers with guns and dogs, whether they were French soldiers or German soldiers. And they were looking for resistance fighters, escaped Jews, and, other, and others. So, that's, so they had to be very careful. And I'm sure there were other times they had to be careful also and, because but that's a memory you have. I, I still have. And as Judy knows, I don't like German shepherds. But right. <laughs> it, one of the things, you sh one of the things you but, shared with me, Jacques, is that you, um, even though you don't have a lot of specific memories because of your age, you you remember this atmosphere of having to keep quiet. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's. I just had that sense. Right. Right. So as I told one of our friends who was in a similar situation in Europe. You know, we have bits and snippets of things that have happened to us, but we don't have, you know, we were not at teenagers or older where we could remember right. life as from day to day, but we have bits and pieces. And then that was, you know, one time, I re another time I remember I was taken, uh, taken to a hospital and I had an earache and I got the details from the family I visited a number of years ago, back in 1986, I think. And it turned out the father took me out of the hospital. And, we, and I, when we visited that family back in 86, sorry, in 84, my mistake, we found out that the Germans had invaded that hospital. And had I been there, I don't think I would be here today. So, so to, just to make sure we all understand, so you'd been taken to the hospital but the father came and pulled yeah, you and out of there. Why I was taken there, yeah. it doesn't make sense. But he got you out of But him. he, uh, they knew. And then they raided the hospital right. and. Now, those were the two tough moments, but the best moment that I remember was uh, June 6, 1944, France was. Uh, before we come to that, okay. a couple more questions before we okay. come to, to D-Day. Um, you've also come to understand that, that your mother may have been able to visit you. That's what I was told. You were told. Yeah, but so. I don't. So sometime between when you went into hiding uh, with the Boca Hoots and before she was uh, taken and then sent, sent to Auschwitz. Yeah, that, right, they told me that and I just don't. You don't know, but. There was a sense that I, yes. Uh, oh yeah, for example, they told me that uh, one day I, you know, I used to be somewhat talkative, but then I became very sad over time. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was, had been told that my mother had been taken and I would not see her again. But, the details I just can't you know, right, right. Vague, vague, vaguely remember that. And and f presumably for the Boca Hoots, uh, hiding you was they were at risk for right. doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so they were they were taking a risk by doing that. Do you know from what you've learned from the family? Do you know how they any in, how they explain the presence of you and your sister in their home? Very carefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they had other kids, so also it was, you know, they, they were in the outskirts and it wasn't, uh, 
they were not, uh, they didn't want, they were definitely against the war and they were able to do that. Mm -hmm. and, they, and as you said, because they're on the outskirts, yeah. they didn't have the gendarmerie All around. The place, them, not like in place. Paris, where right, Grand, Paris right, was like ground right, zero. Right. They, they, as part of your um, hiding you, the, the clandestine yeah. nature of that, you were baptized as a Catholic yeah, by the Boko yeah, Hoots. Yeah. Right, that was part of it. So. so they must have explained you know, that to folks in case right. anybody raised that. Um, when you visited with the Boko Hoots, um, uh, which 1983 or 86, when, yeah. when you visited with them for the first time, what else were you able to learn from them about those circumstances that you and Annette, your sister, were living under with them? Well, what I learned is that once the war ended, okay, mm -hmm. we were separated from them completely. So, and if, and I learned from the uh, their children, who were like teenagers at that time, maybe 12, 14, 16. So, they, you know, they were part of the uh, family, but they were not in charge. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what, that's sort of what I learned. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but after the war, I think they, I think a few, they may have hidden a few other kids, but oh, you, everybody was left. But you and think the, they may have hidden other, other we, Jewish children? Right, right. Okay. Because, and they had their own kids, right? right? Yeah. And the OSE, that organization that was in charge, uh, you know, monitored where all the kids were. And they were, there was also money involved. There was also religion involved because after the war, they wanted to keep us and you know, convert us to being Catholic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was kind of an issue at right, that time. Right, right, So you started to tell us a few minutes ago um, about an event in 1944. Is this when you remember the Allies coming through? Yeah, well maybe, not. okay, June 6, 1944 was D-Day. Was D-Day. But mm -hmm. Paris was liberated in August, uh, actually, almost 24th, I think, mm -hmm. 1945. So during that time, I'm pretty sure it was during the summer, the townspeople all of a sudden were, you know, got out of, out of uh, went to the highway, to the main highway, and we could see uh, tanks coming and soldiers coming. And it could have been Americans or British or Canadians, we didn't know, we didn't, uh, no idea which one. But it was like July 4th and people were shouting and being happy. And, and you remember that? Oh yeah, Okay. very much. Mm -hmm. And the soldiers were throwing out candy to the kids, Hershey bars, mm -hmm. gum, and everybody was, you know, pretty happy. Now, at that time, I didn't know what, what it was, but obviously by the, I learned it was so the with, liberation of France. So with the liberation of France and Paris in late August 1944, of course, the war would not end until May of 1945 Fine, elsewhere. Right. But following the end of the war, the organization that had saved you, the Osei, um, they removed you from the home of the Boko Hoots, right. took you to an orphanage, then later moved you to another where you and Annette remained right. until 1945. What, what do you know about the circumstances in which Osei came to take you okay. from the Boko so Hoots? The mission during the war was to save as many kids as possible, put them in hiding. But the mission after the war was the reverse, to take the kids out of hiding and try to reunite them with their parents and, right. or other family members. So for some, I don't know how they knew this, but they knew that my parents had not survived the war. So they were connect, connected to the Polish government and others, you know, other organizations. Uh, uh, one uncle that you saw there, he survived Auschwitz and he could not take care of his two kids, and my sister and I. I had another uncle and I'm quite, not quite sure what happened there. So the, the uh, family decided, my family said, to send us to an orphanage, which we, were, which we did on the coast of uh, Brittany uh, in France. And then in 47, we went to another one, another orphanage. But the main thing about the orphanage, those were considering everything else. They were the best time of our lives at that, that time because we came out of hiding, we played with other kids, we learned about our religion, we were fed, we went to school. Except for the issue, except for the issue that some of us were orphaned, but right. you know we were all in the same situation. Before we, before you, <coughs> you say more about that for us, Jacques, tell us some. Do you have any recollection of what it was like to 
um, leave the Boko Hood household. You'd been there for, you know, three, three plus years. I just followed orders. Just followed orders, okay. At that time. Mm -hmm. no, no recollection of how, what happened exactly. And so from there, when Osei got you and Yannette, you were still together, obviously. Yeah. So the first orphanage was on the coast, as you said, Normandy yeah. or yeah. Brittany? Brittany. Brittany. What, what, what kind of place was that, do you know? Well, um, well, let me tell you first about the family in Jose. Okay. The issue was they wanted to keep us, I understand. They did want to keep yeah. you, okay. But there was money involved. I mean, the Jose people also, in some cases, sent money to the families who okay. were hiding us. But they knew, that, you know, the Jose said we couldn't, they could not, they could not keep us. We had to take them out, right. so. As far as the orphanage I, on the coast, we went swimming, we went to school, it was, mm -hmm. Very much, very close to the ocean, so it was pretty nice. And then from there... And then we went to another one outside of Paris called Taverny. Taverny. That's where, uh, actually, Elie Wiesel was sent there after, uh, after he was liberated from uh, Buchenwald. But when he went, I wasn't there, but I got in, in 1947. And again, it was, you know, it was a place for all the kids to be basically in the same situation, so. You, you described Taverny to me sort of like a, a chateau. With yeah, oh, these... yeah, they were called home. They were, yeah, they, many of the orphanages were homes or mm -hmm, chateaus. Mm -hmm. And there you were with all these other kids yeah, yeah. who'd mm -hmm. been in hiding up till that point. So, um, as you said, that was for you was a happy place. Right. Yeah. Was that a place where they um, began to um, try to instill in you a sense of your religious heritage. Right, we, right. That, that and schooling in, in a French school. Education. Education. Right. education. Uh, being with other kids, you know, reclaiming our lives as, as children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all of that. Mm -hmm. were, were these, um, like Taverny and the place you were at in Brittany, were they, um, were they actually owned by Osei, or do you know the arrangements? Uh, they had made arrangements. I mean, they got money from uh, the Jewish community in the United States and s some other Jewish, mm -hmm. uh, other money from the French government. Mm -hmm. But they had a number of homes, and and during the war itself, they had saved. Uh, they had sent some kids from Austria and Germany to homes in South mm -hmm. Southern France. Mm -hmm. So it was quite complicated. And of course, this at this time, this is post-war. France. Right. France is shattered by the war. Oh, yeah. Right. What, do you have any sense of what conditions were like? Um, no. No. No, no, no. You were sort of in this protected, uh, happy place for well, you. Well, we were trying to relearn about our lives as right. kids. So right. we, the big, I'm sure we learned something about the bigger events, but... Uh, but in terms of food shortages, you don't... No, no, no I don't remember that, that at all. No. Believe me, whatever we did, we were happy, the, right, much happier right. than the previous years. Do you... Jacques, do you know when you realized or understood that you weren't going to see your parents again? That's a good question, but I do not remember that at all. Remember that at the all. thing is, we were with other kids who were in the same situation, so it was like almost being like, nor in a sense, normal, not, nothing you know, unusual. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we were not the only ones. Right, right. Do you know how many kids were there with you? In Tyrone, I think about 80. About 80 kids. Yeah, about I have a list kids. somewhere. Okay, okay. In, in, at Tyrone in 1948, you were visited by an American couple, mm -hmm. the Fines, who had later adopted you and Annette and brought you to the United States. Tell us what you can about meeting the Fines and then what happened after that and about moving to the United okay, States. Well, they came to uh, that orphanage in Tyrone and why they wound up in Tyrone, unfortunately, I'll never know because they did pass away in about 10, 15 years ago and never asked them, but they were very well connected to the uh, Jewish community of New York, New Jersey. But they did wind up at Taverny and then saw my sister and I, and they liked my sister, they liked me, and they, we came as a package. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't, I, actually, uh, one time we, they came to um, Paris so we visited them in Paris also. So we saw a bit of them and... You know, so it wasn't they came the very first oh, time no, right. and you left with them. Right. It, was sort of a, it was a process. Right. A process. It was a process. Probably you know, six months or something Six like months, that. something like that. Yeah. 
And then eventually one day we were told we were going to the United States and I followed orders. I mean, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, at that time, mm -hmm. although I was a bit older, I was, mm -hmm. you know, you just don't have too much control of your life, especially did, from did, my situation. Did you come to the United States with them or did you come? No, we came, my, my sister and I, we had a chaperone with a few other kids. We went from uh, Paris to Marseille and then uh, October 8th we left France and got to the United States October 23rd. With a chaperone? With a chaperone. Was, was it a chaperone from Ose, do you know? Uh, could have been. Could have been. She yeah. lived in, actually in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. What, do you remember your, your uh, ship ride? Your, um, yeah, it was kind of neat. You yeah. know, I learned uh, being with the other kids, and I learned not to play uh, chess. <laughs> On the ship? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, there were a lot of other pe people. Mm -hmm. and. But a key date was uh, October 8th when we arrived in the morning and uh, lots of people were moving towards, you know, one side of the boat. And that's, it was foggy, but they wanted, they were aware that there was a Statue of Liberty uh, they were seeing, so. So you're, was, you're 10, I think, right? I, I, actually, I was 10 years old on the, on the trip. On the trip, you turned 10 on the trip. So you arrive in the U.S. What was what was that like for you, and and what what you know about for your sister too? What was what kind of adjustments did you have to make given all that you had been well, through? Well, first, first of all, uh, we knew we were being uh, you know coming to the United States, right? And uh, but among other things, we had to do we had to learn a new language, a new family, new uh, culture, uh, new uh, schooling was an issue because I started you know, although I was ten years old. And the family who adopted me was very well to, was well to do, not very well to, but well to do. Went to private school, but I started at ten years old. I was in the first grade. So but here you are, school, ten years old, first grade. Um, but I made up all the grades later. Very quickly, right? <laughs> and became a computer scientist, right? right. <laughs> Absolutely. But that must have been. I, I don't know if you remember from that, but that had to be a, a, a tough adjustment. Yeah, the it, it, it was. Yeah, right. it was. You know, because with the kids outside, I spoke only French and, you know, trying to assimilate right. with everybody else. Mm -hmm. was not, uh, mm -hmm. And Annette went through a very similar experience. Yeah, and she, not only that, she was two years younger, so right, it was even, right. her memory is even less than, than mine at that time. And this was New Jersey, yeah. in New Jersey. And you, and after that, you stayed with, the, of course, with the Fines, your new family. Yeah. And it, in, You've been back to France several times right. to visit the Bocoud family. Um, um, what was it like to? What was it like for you after that gap of you know, more than three decades to to find was, them uh, and, and get to know them? Uh, it was quite difficult because I, I had from 1945. You know, I was completely uh, separated from them, and. Uh, I was able to find the address from the Ose offices in Paris, France, and fortunately, they uh, they were still still at that, that address. I went with my cousins and friends, and you know it was shocking. I just couldn't. I don't know, I don't know if we hugged, but we did speak to each other, and they were excited. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it was definitely strange. Mm -hmm. Do they still live in the farmhouse? That oh, uh, by now they're probably. Uh, at that time, and we that, back. And, uh, no, because it became a more like a suburb. Uh, more like a suburb. Okay. Sub somewhat of a suburb. Okay, you've um, you've learned a lot uh, about your time in Taverni from from reading Ose documents. Some, uh, in fact, I think you read a dossier on you. Mm -hmm. What did you learn in those documents that are very well uh, detailed? Well, I learn also you can really learn about your life if you can kind of dig. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it took, you know, here's my doc. I mean, I work, this is what I use, and it took me, you know, most people I'm sure have albums of, of their lives over the first 10 years. This took me 30, 40 years to put, to this, put together. this together. And I, I treasure it, you know, it's like my Bible, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I learn bits and pieces, but it's oh, what's impossible to to learn is exactly how things happened. You know, how, did, how were my parents taken exactly? Or when did this happen? Or when were these photographs taken or anything? Mm -hmm. what, what other kinds of information have you learned from your dossier, what you saw in the OSE documents? I think there were letters that were written. Oh, well, it's not only yeah. me. It's, okay, this is about me, but they, they saved the lives of many other kids. Of and they course, had dossiers yeah. on 
many other kids. Right, and we, right. But uh, you had access to yours. You were able right, to Right, I was yours. able to, and other people have, can do the same right, thing, right, even right, to this day. The, right. As a matter I got a letter from France, actually, a few days ago, an email. Uh, okay, let me go on the OZ. What happened also with the OZ in the United States, a number of other people were saved by the OZ, and we formed an organization called OZ USA. It's like a network, and we kind of get together, we talk to each other, and we connect. We raise some money and send it to France. And sometimes we try to get information about us or other people. But uh, two days ago, one of the persons from the OSE sent us an email, wanted to know the name, where is this person called actually, uh, Leon Schwartz. Do we know where he is? So I, it so happens we have somebody in our database with a similar name, so I sent it to France. And I'm not quite sure what's going to happen because that was only yesterday. But it may be the Leon Schwartz they're looking who for. Knows, who, knows? Right. who knows? Also, because in terms of names, also spelling was an issue. You know, every once in a while, like my last name originally was Carpeak. That's K A R P I K, but in some other places, it's K R P I C. So it's not a big deal, but sometimes when you try to find information, you've got to be aware that it's right, not right, all 100% right, 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 correct. Right. You know, in those days, there was no computers. There were no computers and internet and all that good stuff. So. And, and speaking of the, the others that were with you at um, the Taverni, the, uh, at, or possibly, tell us about Felice. Okay, well, when I came to the United States in 1948, the kids from um, Taverni sent me some letters. They wanted to know how I was doing, and uh, they missed us, and everybody wrote a few notes. So fast forward to 1983 the American gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors in, uh, in Washington. And what they did, among other things, they broke up the uh, people by tape, by tape, by, by country. So I went to the and, French And this table. was the, your first gathering, right? With yes. Yes, OK. So it was at the Washington Convention Center. And it was a pretty large uh, gathering. And, uh, actually, there was another one in 1981 in Jerusalem. So that was the first one. But okay. I never went there. So 83, we went, I went with a friend of mine from Columbia, from Maryland, Columbia, which is very close to Baltimore. And we went to the French table. So there so are tables for the different countries different where countries. kids were. That's okay. on the, okay. These conventions are usually set up okay. that way. Okay. And somebody, you know, you play, give names. And this lady said, what's your name? She says, Felice. I said, that's interesting. I've got a letter from somebody named Felice. So I went back to my house, which was maybe an hour away came back, showed her the letter, and she screamed because that was her. <laughs> that was the letter she wrote to you? Yeah, she had written to me. And uh, so so she, we were in the same orphanage in Taverny. And it so happened when she came to the United States, I lived in Newark, New Jersey, and then Union. And she lived in, uh, I think, living, I forgot, Livingston or Teaneck, which is in, New Jer in the same general section of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we've, been, you know, we've kept up our friendship. Mm -hmm. So and, and you still have those letters that the kids at Taverny wrote to you yep. when you left? Yep. Okay. Well, Jacques, what was it like for you to go to your first gathering of other children survivors? What, what was that like for you? Well, the main thing it was that, okay, in terms of survivors, if I guarantee you if I was most people on the street, Holocaust survivor, most of them will say concentration camps or ghettos, okay? But there was another class of survivors like us who were children during the war, who were hidden, who ran. And they, so, you know, they were just in tough situation as those who were in concentration camps. Because, I, like for example, one of my friends who survived uh, in Poland, she had to survive by uh, crossing a river, except she didn't know how to swim. So, you know, she was maybe eight or, I don't know, seven, eight years old. And for her to do that, you know, it's not. I guarantee you it was pretty scary for her. Right. And others were in similar situations. So the main thing was to see other, other people who were in the same similar situation, who were born in the 30s, never went to concentration, or, no, few went to concentration camps. And from that we formed a, a group and a few more groups. And then we have an association of child survivors of the Holocaust, mainly kids who were people who were children during the World War II. Very few were in, some were in concentration camps because they were able to survive. And then that led you to so that, yeah, help right. found another organization well, right. here locally. Yeah. Shock, um, 
your sister Annette, um, how how's her life been since um, well, she came uh, to the U.S.? I f good question. But she's okay from my point of view and our family point of view. She's got a lonely life, but she enjoys what she's doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She's never married. She's kind of she has some friends, but you know we never have a good sense of. That she has a good network to be with. In but fact, she's been living in Israel since 1962, and that's what she wants to do. If, if I remember correctly, you, you had her come to the United States and attend her first meeting right. of other child survivors. Is that right? Yeah, I forgot what, 1983, uh, mm -hmm. no, 1990 or something. Right, I right. And, but again, being Jewish in the United States is quite different than being Jewish in, the, in Israel because. As you know, there are quite a number of Jews who live in Israel, so it's a, bit, a different environment. Right, right, right. So, but was that when she came? But to then the meeting? she, once she came to this convention, to, to this uh, convention, she kind of finally realized that she did, you know, about her past, and she right, kind of opened right. up. You, you mentioned, um, I, th I think, mentioned two uncles that survived Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Are you aware of any other members of your extended family who survived? The answer is yes, I know there are others, mm -hmm. but who they are, I have no idea. No idea about that? No idea. Okay. We have, we have time to turn to our audience for some questions. Should we do that? Okay. Um, um, it's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. So when we close our program, I'm going to turn back to Jacques to close it. But uh, before we do that, We'd like to see if you have some questions that you'd like to ask Jacques. We, um, we have microphones on either side of the aisle. Gabriel has one here, and I think Molly or somebody's bringing a, a, a microphone down on this side. Um, please wait till you have the microphone. Try to make your question as brief as you can. I'll repeat it just to make sure we all, and particularly Jacques, hears it. Um, and then he'll answer your questions. So let's see if any of you have any questions you'd like to ask Jacques. We have some, we have some time for this. Um, so we'll look, we brave soul right up front here. Gabriel, thank you. Okay. Do you continue to practice Judaism? And did, is that how you raised your children? The question is, do you continue to practice Judaism? And is that how you've raised your okay. family? Let me make one opening statement first. Okay. I've done this first person about six, five or six years, so I'm kind of used to you know, doing this. So. As far as being Jewish in Judaism, uh, again, when I was in an orphanage, I finally learned that I was Jewish and practiced that. And as far as my children, one of them is here, Rachel, and the answer is basically yes. They are involved. They are Jewish, but you know, at different levels. But there's been no problems being Jewish. Thank you, Jacques. Thank you. Do we have another question anywhere? Anybody got a question you'd like to ask? There we go. The gentleman back here. Okay. Thank you very much for this testimony. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, why in your view uh, you think anti-Semitism is still existing today and what is the best way to fight it in your view? The question is, do you think anti-Semitism, if I'm getting this right, exists today? And what, what's your thought about the best way to fight it? Uh, that's a very tough question. Yeah. The answer does exist today in different forms. And uh, as far as, I never thought of how to fight it, but the main thing about fight, would be to tell the truth as much as possible. You know, like talking about what's happening instead of hiding it. Instead of hiding it. Yeah, doing exactly what you're doing here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And it's a very complicated okay. process. Have, I mean, it's not trivial. Okay. I think there's a young fella here with a hand up um, over here. Oh, yeah. Okay. How did you feel while you were in the ditch? How did you feel when you were in the ditch? Good question, but that's one of the few things I really remember that right. I really felt what's going on. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I just knew there was something wrong. And then when I saw the, you know, the soldiers, or the, whether it was police with guns and dogs, it did not feel very good. And as I said before, to this day, I still don't like. Don't like German shepherds. And, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you for that question. Good question, um, yeah. yeah. And we have one right here. Thank you. And I, 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 let me add one thing. The reason I remember this is because it obviously made a big impact on, my, right. on me. You know. And one that has stuck with you oh, for yeah. all these years. Absolutely. Okay. 
the OSC organization. You mentioned a book about that. What was that? I'd like to read it. I mentioned a book about OSE. Um, okay. Um, did I mention a book? There was a, a Nazi hunter in France called Serge Klarsfeld, K-L-A-R-S-F-E-L-D. And he listed all the Jews that were deported. So it's not an OSE book per se, but it's a book about the Jews of France who were deported. And, the, and OSE is mentioned. And um, the French name is Oeuvre, O-E-U-V-R-E-S, O-A-U-X, Secours, S-E-C-O-U-R-S, Des Enfants. If you look up in the website, you'll find some information. OSE saved many, many children. Thousands. thousands. But unfortunately, more, many more thousands were never saved. Of course. Like in France, it's estimated, like in the Holocaust, it's estimated that 1.5 million kids were not saved. And in France, uh, about 80,000 were deported. From France. From France. Do you, has, there, has there been a book written about OSE? Do you know? Yes. There has. Okay. And I can't give you the exact names. Yeah. Actually, I'm reading a book about um, called The uh, Village of Secrets. It's about Vichy, France, and how there was a village, a section of France, where Le Chambon saved a number of children. The, the inhabitants were pacifists. And In this particular village? Book, and it mentions Jose all over the okay. place. Okay. V village of Secrets. Yeah. Village of Secrets. Okay. All right. A uh, young lady right here. Right up here, yeah. Um, when you were learning about your family, did you have to interview anybody that was like in it, like you were in it kind of a little bit? So that was at the camps. Okay. So when you, when you were learning about your family, did you interview people to learn uh, about your family? Is that, am I getting yeah. that right? Okay. All right, the only, okay, I did find out that I had a cousin who was still living. 1984. So I've been writing to her. So from 1945, uh, I came. Here. The war ended in 1945. So 37 years later, not 38 years later, I found out that I had a family member who was still living. So I was able to write to her. She speaks English, and her husband speaks English also. So I, that's how I got some information. And actually, I got here a letter from them, from her in 1984, telling me about my parents and some of their history. So, so the answer is yes, I was able to do that with, with a me member of my family. Right. Oh, good. That was great. Yeah. Another question right there, yeah. And then uh, one more thing. I did find out more also from the member of the OSE organization. Mm -hmm. I found out from them and how they operated during the war. Like, for example, as far as saving kids, they sent out leaflets and they went around to the Jewish homes to say, hey, you're in trouble, you want to save your, you know, your kids, you may, you may have to put them in hiding. I mean, imagine for, for all of us in this room, trying to imagine when your mom made that right. decision right. that I've, I've got to do this now, I've got to put my daughter and my, my son mm -hmm. into hiding. I can't imagine how how profound that was to make that decision, how courageous it was. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I heard that you have grandchildren. Yes. What do you want your grandchildren to learn from your experience? What do you want them to remember? Good question. What do you, what do you want your grandchildren to okay. learn from what you went through? Well, I think I've sh taught them, and Rachel and Judy will verify, that, that I went through the Holocaust and I was able to survive because of the help of strangers. Mm -hmm. So, and I, and I think they understood that. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, um, my, uh, my oldest granddaughter told me one day, you were adopted, I'm adopted. And she was also adopted, so she reminds me that I was adopted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, my oldest grandson is named Samuel. Well, that was the name of my, in English, the name of my birth father was Samuel, so they kind of know. And hopefully next year, the, my two, they may come here to the first person. I hope so. We'll yeah. look forward to having them here. Yeah, I think we have time for, we have, oh, a couple more. Okay. Young lady here in yellow. Yes, you. Yep. Um, oh. um, when you were on the farm, did you get any 
pastries or treats. Oh, when you were on the farm, <laughs> do you know if you got any pastries or treats of any kind? Uh, well, I'm going to finesse the question. I was too young to remember, but I was, I don't remember being hungry, let's put it this way, or starving, mm -hmm. or being scared, per se. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure I was fed, but it probably was the regular milk and cheese and bread and, being a and maybe they had treats. Yeah. But. Thank you. And I think we have one more question, uh, gentlemen, behind you. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask, so um, after your um, coming to the United States, I wonder how you were able to adapt into the environment given that you didn't know your background until 1984. So uh, my question is, how were you able to adopt with the um, culture, uh, American uh, community, and uh, how were you able to uh, uh, blend in together? So when you came okay. to the United States, 10 years old, uh, okay. what was it like for you? What, how did you adapt and, okay. and become part okay. of American culture? So, okay, so in terms of me knowing about my background, I, I didn't really deal with it, as you said, as mm -hmm. I said, until 19, uh, 1983 when the, right. the gathering occurred. But first thing I had to do was to, you know, be an American, understand the language, uh, the culture, schooling, the new, new family, mm -hmm. and I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is, although I knew I was a bit different than the other kids, because I had been born in, in a different country in, in, in my past, I don't think I ever played the uh, Holocaust card. You know, and I, I don't think I ever said, oh boy, I started grade one when I was 10, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I, I didn't go, you know, I didn't play the Holocaust card per se, even after 1984, so that's how I was able to deal with it. Okay. Okay, okay. One more, I think one more question and then we're going to close. Actually, keep, hands keep popping up. With young fellow in the very back. We'll, we'll get the two there and then we'll, we'll close it, okay. Have, have you kept in contact with the Catholic family that protected you? Have you, since you visited the Boca Hoots in the 1980s, uh, have you kept in touch with the family? I tried to, again, but it was very, very difficult and they, um, uh, the answer is basically no. Mm -hmm. And again, those times were so different that it's, you know, it's hard to, to really explain what happened. And I think we told me that when you went back in the 1980s, the parents had already passed away oh, yeah, at that passed point, away. So, uh, so this was their children. Yeah. And as, as a matter of fact, when we visited them once, uh, they were about I don't know, th I don't know, three or four living sisters, I think. So we visited them, but the other sister and the sister we visited were not on the same page, and they were had major disagreements. So we had to come back again to see the other oh. one. <laughs> but you okay. know, families. <laughs> one we have, I think, a young fellow in the very back with his hand up. Um, let's let's get your question, then we're going to close our program. Was it normally sad when um, when you're at the orphanage? Did any when your other friends got adopted? Was it sad? Oh, when, when you were at the orphanage and your other friends got adopted, was that, were you really sad about that? Uh, I, I only remember being uh, comfortable in the orphanage. I don't remember when, they got, when other people got adopted. Some people did not get adopted because their fa they found out their family Had survived. members were still surviving somewhere. So it was a process. Mm -hmm. but, but I do, my, you know, the best thing I can remember is it was very, the best of times considering what had happened right, in the right. previous six years. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for all your questions. Um, when we finish, when Jacques finishes, um, Jacques is gonna remain here on stage, so if you have a question that we didn't get to or you think of another one, it's a great opportunity to come up here and ask him or just you know get your photograph taken with him or just say hi. So uh, Jacques, you'll stay here with us for a while sure. afterwards for that purpose. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being with us today. This is our final program of the year. We'll resume first person in March of 2017. Our website um, pro will provide information about next year's program. About uh, We hope that we'll have Jacques back with us in 2017, if he's willing. And so his date, along with uh, others, um, we run two programs a week, Wednesdays and Thursdays, for five months. Uh, before I turn to Jacques for his last word to close the program, 
Um, I'd like to uh, take the liberty of, because it is our last program, just acknowledging the tremendous group of people that make First Person possible. Our program manager, Sonia Booth, uh, Emily Potter, um, who comes from Survivor Affairs, our wonderful interns and volunteers and other museum staff, Dave and Tom, who none of you will meet, but they sit up in the sound booth and handle all the uh, technical effects that makes this possible, like microphones and lighting. It's just a, a wonderful team that makes First Person possible. And I, I want to thank all of them on behalf of the survivors who are our guests here, uh, that it's a great group of people that do great work. Ray's over here, uh, attends all of our programs. So thank you all very much, and thank you for being a great audience. And hold it, don't, don't clap yet, we got it. You'll get your chance. We have a last word from um, from Jacques. Okay, last word. Okay. okay. Stand up. Do you or stand, sit? Whatever need, you'd like okay. to do. Your pleasure. Okay. So first of all, uh, let me sit down. Okay. Sit down. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to thank Bill and all the staff at the museum for doing this. And Bill has been doing this for six, seventeen um, seventeen years. So that's quite an ongoing process and dedicated process. And he's been very good. And as I said, I've done this about five or six times, so it's not difficult for me to do, but it's, you know, it feels good. Um, and I also want to thank the staff of the museum for being fantastic in doing this. Second, I'd like to thank all of you for coming here and my family, Rachel, Judy, and our friend Melissa. So it was nice of them to come. And they're really, they're really my, Judy is really my support in this whole process, along with Rachel, but Judy's, been living with me for, since 1984, so she's the one who's been the backbone of, of my experiences here. Now, as far as the Holocaust, all I want to tell you is that um, they're def you know, no, no one story is the same, and even people who survive concentration camps, they've got different stories, you know. It's all the same, but it's all different. You know, what I did before the war, during the war, and after the war. But the details are always different. And it's amazing how much stuff I learn about doing this. You learn quite a bit from the different questions that are being asked, which is always interesting. And I really want to thank the younger people for asking questions. I was, you know, they were really, really good of you guys to do it. And um, I hope you learned something different about the Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you.